Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry I'm late. I, I had uh, for the first time a Zoom glitch. It didn't, it didn't let me in. Uh, so forgive me, I'm not Katie Walker. I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Joshua Hare. <laughs> and um, I, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce the, uh, this year's Lipson Lecture, which is our, um, our eighth Lipson Lecture. Um, this uh, uh, lecture came about from the uh, Lipson family, and we are very pleased to have um, uh, Shelley Lipson join us uh, for this lecture. This is the Arthur E. Lipson uh, lectureship in, in uh, renal disease. And uh, this, this lectureship came about eight years ago from a wonderful gift from the Lipson family uh, in honor of uh, Arthur Lipson, who was a very prominent a CPA in town and a, a very prominent um, Jewish philanthropist, um, very involved in um, Jewish education, um, health care, and um, a big proponent of, of uh, genetic testing for um, disorders that are that run in, in Jewish families. Um, he, uh, after his passing, we received a wonderful gift from the family led, led by Shelley to the Interdisciplinary Stem Cell Institute to promote um, uh, research in renal regeneration, and but but more broadly in uh, in understanding and advancing knowledge about uh, renal diseases. So we we're uh, thrilled to have this lectureship in its in its eighth year, and I'll turn it over to have our um, our esteemed speaker be introduced. Thank you. All right. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Louis Vinson. I'm one of the internal medicine chief residents, and it's truly an honor to be able to present Dr. Shustak today. Uh, the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, again, is very pleased to present the eighth annual Arthur E. Lipson Professorship in Kidney Disease Talk with Dr. Shustak. Uh, she was born in Hungary, began her studies at the Semmelweis University in Budapest, where she got her MD, PhD. Uh, before completing her internal medicine residency and nephrology fellowship at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, she went on to obtain a master's at Albert Einstein, where she stayed on as faculty, and later joined the University of Pennsylvania as a professor of medicine and genetics in 2017. Uh, Dr. Shustak has had an illustrious career as a physician scientist, earning a Young Investigator Award from the American Society of Nephrology, uh, tremendous honor as a Brenner lecturer from the American Society of Nephrology and the Richards Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Society of Nephrology, among many other distinctions. She's co-authored over 100 pub 180 publications to date and serves on the editorial board for a number of high-impact journals. Her lab has made a number of discoveries fundamental to defining critical genes and mechanisms of kidney disease with tremendous translational relevance and therapeutic potential. We are truly, truly honored to have her lecturing today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Catalin Shustak. All right, thank you so much for the kind invitation. And it's a real honor to uh, speak to you today. Uh, and I hope uh, one day I will be able to visit uh, the University of Miami. And I would like to personally thank Mrs. Lipson for um, sponsoring this particular lectureship. So, uh, getting into, so what the title of my talk will be Diabetes and Kidney Disease, uh, giving you some novel insights and, and hopefully new um, uh, things that we have been uh, discovering and working on lately. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, these are, they, they have no uh, real um, bearing for the talk that I will be giving to you today. So today's lecture is going to have covered three um, subsegments. One, uh, we will give a little bit of a, uh, a, a rundown about the diagnosis, treatment, and management of uh, diabetes and diabetic kidney disease. Uh, then we will uh, discuss the new standard of care. We just had the American Society of Nephrology meeting. Uh, I am really happy that I am able to talk to you about new drugs, uh, clinical trials, and new practice guidelines uh, that you are able to implement in your practice very soon. And the last section of this talk, I will talk to you about future therapies. 
some of uh, that I am very passionately interested, some precision medicine approaches, and then hopefully bringing nephrology to the era of molecular nephrology and genetic testing, and some as actually occurring in collaborations with the University of Miami Renal Division. So uh, as usual, um, at our place uh, for Medicine Grand Rounds, I would like to start with a case. And this is a case, patient of mine uh, where I attended the Philadelphia VA, a 51-year-old male uh, referred by primary care for progressive uh, EGFR, kidney function decline. Patient had type 2 diabetes for 22 years, retinopathy, neuropathy, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, hydrochlorothiazide, amlodipine, carvedilol, metformin, statin, and gabapentin is the drugs. Uh, patient is supposedly allergic to lisinopril uh, because it's coughing. Uh, family history is significant. The father died of dialysis. Uh, blood pressure 145 over 70, BMI 29, no edema. Labs, uh, creatinine is 1.5 with a GFR of 45. Uh, albumin creatinine ratio of uh, 2,200 and an A1C of 7.6. So I guess this is a patient that probably all too familiar to you as well, and you may have many of such patients in your clinical practice. So let's try to dive in. Um, what should we do for this particular patient? So let's start with the diagnosis. Uh, so obviously, uh, the patient most likely have diabetic kidney disease. So how do we diagnose diabetic kidney disease? So the gold standard diagnosis for diabetic kidney disease is a kidney biopsy. Uh, and if you were to do a kidney biopsy, uh, we would see something like this. And uh, so what are the lesions that we, that we see here? Uh, so there are several of them. So the most, the earliest lesions in diabetic kidney disease is the thickening of the basement membrane, which actually you cannot see on uh, light microscopy. You need an electron microscope uh, to, uh, to see that. What you see here is uh, expansion of the mesangium. So these are the glomeruli in the kidney. These are the filtering unit. Uh, and the mesangium is somewhere in between the epithelial cell and the endothelial cells. You see that there is... Um, pink material here, uh, which is kind of um, fibrotic material. What you see here is a very wonderful example of uh, something called nodular sclerosis or Kimmel-Stilwinsel nodules. You see over here, these are the so-called Kimmel-Stilwinsel nodules that we view, uh, heard in medical school. In addition, what you see here is significant tubular interstitial fibrosis. So a normal kidney section would look, um, I don't know, actually, I cannot find an area here where you would have normal tubal cells. Uh, maybe these segments over here. What you see here is that the epithelial cells are kind of atrophied, so kind of flat. Uh, the basement membrane here is thick and wrinkled, even the tubular basement membrane. And you see that the interstitium is expanded. There are cells here that should not be. There, there are matrix here that should not be. And there are immune cells around here that should not be. In addition, I hope you see this particular vessel here where you see uh, arterial hyalinosis and then uh, uh, intimal thickening. You, I'm sure, appreciate that this vessel does not look very normal to you. Uh, and then you see that there is um, significant um, changes in the blood vessels as well. So this is what we would see if we would do the gold standard. We would take a kidney biopsy from this particular patient. Uh, but as you know, in, in real life, we actually don't perform a kidney biopsy. Most of the time for patients who have a diabetes and kidney disease, and we make the diagnosis based on a constellation of findings. And these are um, reduction of kidney function, EGFR of less than 60, albuminuria, urinary albumin creatinine ratio of 30 milligram per gram creatinine. And then also uh, it should happen not at the beginning because it takes time for diabetic kidney disease to develop. So uh, at least five years after the diagnosis of patients with type one diabetes and in type two diabetes, because the start of the diabetes is unclear, it could be even uh, at the time when we diagnose it. 
As a nephrologist, I want to highlight several issues that we use as a potential exclusion criteria. And these are the times when I think you should refer their patients uh, to the uh, nephrology clinic. Um, absence of retinopathy, especially in patients with type 1 diabetes, because retinopathy correlates very, very strongly with kidney disease. Uh, and if you don't see that in patients with type 1 diabetes, you should definitely consider sending to the renal clinic. As I said, the albuminuria development, if it happens if less than five years or greater than 25 years, it's relatively atypical for a diabetic kidney disease patients. Therefore, again, a referral needed. Urinary sediment. Uh, diabetic kidney disease is not associated with nephritis. So if you have significant have, uh, hematuria or an active urinary sediment, that's atypical. If you have an acute kidney function decline, starting of a RAS blockade um, uh, is atypical. In addition, as you know, uh, the proteinuria is a key feature of diabetic kidney disease, but we always look for other causes of so-called nephrotic syndrome or significant proteinuria, such as uh, you want to exclude myeloma, especially for a patient who is in his 50s, uh, lupus, I think if you have some pretest probabilities, and hepatitis uh, B and C, especially C, because now it's a treatable disease condition. So usually this is the clinical constellation which we use to establish a uh, diagnosis of diabetic kidney disease. Here in this patient has a GFR decline, has albuminuria, and this constellation actually happened 22 years after, the, um, after diabetes. So this is a fairly typical, so we could say with reasonably high confidence. And under those circumstances, I personally, we check the urine, we check, we rule out other nephrotic syndrome causes um, to make sure. All right, so that ties into the natural history of diabetic kidney disease, which many of you probably re re remember quite well. Uh, uh, you know, your kidney function is roughly about 100 cc um, uh, per minute per uh, 173 square meter for the GFR, which is usually at the early stages associated with hyperfiltration. Your GFR can go up to even 180. And that phase is followed by a progressive decline in kidney function. And at the same time, albuminuria increases. I want to highlight two additional factors that I think not presented very well on this typical slide. One is the time course that it usually takes about 10 years for the kidney function to decline because the typical decline of EGFR is roughly about one cc per minute per year. In addition, I also need to highlight to you uh, that um, there is a very significant increase of cardiovascular disease during um, when you have diabetic kidney disease, including death. And indeed, a fraction of patients actually don't, don't make it to dialysis because they die of cardiovascular disease. So, um, so what do we do with a patient like that? Um, so I would uh, highlight two things. One is establishing the diagnosis, uh, an issue that we have discussed, uh, reducing cardiovascular risk, uh, which is a very important factor in reducing renal risk, which is um, going to be the most of the topic which I will talk to you. So I think there are three uh, layers that we use here, the glycemic control, the blood pressure control, and I think evidence-based therapies. So um, probably not news to you, but I think many of the interns maybe actually, I don't know, you were, maybe, were born uh, maybe after these studies came out. This is the very famous DCCT study, uh, the Diabetes Control and Complication Trial, uh, which enrolled 1,500 patients with type 1 diabetes um, way back and then ask the question whether conventional um, hemoglobin A1C of nine versus intense at that point was seven makes a difference in complications development. And the answer was yes, indeed, glycemic control in patients with type one diabetes made a significant difference in terms of patients developing complications, renal disease and cardiovascular disease. Based on these studies, um, roughly this is also 10, 15 years ago now, we went down the road that what happens if we normalize glucose 
Uh, and then maybe if we normalize glucose, we essentially eliminate complications and several studies were performed. Uh, this is one of them, the court study action of control of cardiovascular risk in diabetes, where we tried, uh, remember the change here is standard therapy of A1C of 7.5, intense 6.5, uh, kind of really uh, getting the glucose under control. However, the shocking finding of this trial was that you probably know by now that the intensive therapy did not reduce death rate in patients with diabetes, indicating that in patients with established diabetes, normalizing glucose did not prevent from complications, development, and death. So that's an important uh, issue to keep in mind. Uh, so that led us to the current guidelines. Uh, this is the KDGO guidelines, where we basically proposing an individual's, uh, individualized glycemic guidelines. So you could use an A1C of 6.5, a really intense glucose controls for patients who have, you know, doesn't have CKD, has no microvascular complications, has a long life expectancy and good hypoglycemic awareness. Um, but on the other hand, patients who are older have already established micro and macrovascular complications. The life expectancy is maybe not that long. You may want to use a permissive A1C guidelines of less than eight. Uh, I think the, usually we, we keep it the middle around seven. What is important that these studies essentially uh, shifted us from the previous decade when, when um, diabetologists were really focusing on glycemic control, where we want to prevent complications development, specifically kidney disease and cardiovascular release, rather than just strictly uh, controlling serum glucose levels. And I think that's a very important message that I want to uh, make sure it comes across, which is the real goal right now in patients with diabetes. All right. Blood pressure control, uh, multiple studies, uh, and I just want you to remember that uh, the KDGO, the ADA, and ESD um, is around the 130 over 80 guideline. That's um, the target blood pressure, even though the JNC and a couple of other organizations may use different guidelines. I think it's a to the simplified, I always teach that I think the 130 over 80 is the good um, target goal. Uh, you know that um, uh, we like to use uh, renin angiotensin inhibitors uh, to prevent kidney disease progressions. And these are, again, uh, studies performed 20 years ago uh, with losartan and irbersartan, the renal and NDNT studies. We showed a significant risk reduction in renal endpoints, which is doubling of serum creatinine and stage kidney disease death. Uh, and the risk reduction was somewhere around the 16 to 20% uh, range. Uh, so how this is happening? Um, so this is uh, our stylized kidney. Uh, this is our glomerulus. Uh, we have this um, nomenclature, which everybody hates, uh, the afferent and efferent arteries. So let me just simplify artery going in, uh, filtration and proximal tubules. So, um, the kidney filters, uh, you know, everything under 60 kD, so that includes glucose. Uh, glucose is reabsorbed by a sodium glucose um, uh, coupled reabsorption. And then the distal delivery of sodium uh, is essentially triggers uh, the, by a tubular glomerular feedback of the artery uh, that goes in. And when you have diabetes, obviously you filter a lot more glucose. Therefore you need to, the proximal tubules have to take up more sodium uh, because the reabsorption is coupled. So under those circumstances, the distal sodium delivery is lower. The distal sodium delivery um, tells uh, the kidney that, you know, you are not getting, um, you're not, I'm not getting enough sodium, try to filter more. So the incoming artery is dilated. Uh, that increases the filtration. So that's why you have a hyperfiltration at the, you know, at the early stages of diabetes and increasing the GFR. 
And this is um, leading to blood pressure and salt retention. And this is mediated by having uh, an aldosterone um, uh, in, um, in an angiotensin um, a receptor uh, over here in the afferent to the outgoing artery, which essentially uh, maintains uh, this increased filtration. So the angiotensin blockade is effective because it reduces this hyperfiltration. So you don't have this increased GFR. Indeed, you know, when you give a blocker of the ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor, you have a drop in GFR because you uh, essentially uh, drop this hyperfiltration to a normal level. And on the long term, you prevent this hyperfiltration and you prevent the further damage of the glomerulus and GFR decline and end stage kidney disease development. So, um, over here. So, here is the summary of the first uh, vignette that I wanted to share with you. So, hyperglycemia plays an important role in kidney disease development, um, established, you know, 30 years ago. It's still very important. However, we know that normalizing glucose is not going to prevent diabetic kidney disease. Therefore, our focus in diabetes should be on complication prevention and not just glucose control. I think the A1C of 7 is used um, as a general guideline, but higher and uh, stricter or looser uh, A1C control is acceptable based on the patient age, preference, etc. Uh, remember the blood pressure uh, guideline, which is the 130 over 80. That's our goal. Uh, it's very important um, to prevent uh, kidney function decline. In addition, you remember the ACE and an ARB um, shows uh, protect from renal outcome with a 16 to 20 percent effect size. Uh, and I didn't show you data, but a combinational use is not recommended because it has been tried and it did not work out. So this is kind of the, you know, run of a mill standard, uh, how to uh, diagnose and treat patients with diabetic kidney disease. So what has changed over the last couple of years and what should we do about this case? So here I highlighted the key factors What we have. So obviously the blood pressure here is uh, out of control. The GFR is low, the BMI is high, albuminuria, and an A1C, you know, I mean, I guess we could argue that this is high. So what did I do? Um, I used my script of the pen medicine um, and I gave a prescription for this particular drug, canagliflozin. So what is canagliflozin and why was this the treatment of my choice? So by now you know that this is a, a inhibitor of the sodium glucose uh, transporter. And uh, you know, they do have a very significant protective effect uh, from protection uh, from end-stage kidney disease uh, and death and dialysis. So this is actually the canagliflozin data. Uh, again, giving canagliflozin is associated with an acute drop in GFR compared to the placebo over here. However, over a period of time, and this was um, roughly about four years, uh, the GFR slope was much slower in the gliflozin trial versus the placebo, where there was a very significant GFR decline here indicating that these drugs um, were associated with protection from end-stage kidney disease and all kinds of renal outcomes. All right, so how do they work? So uh, here is going back to my stylized kidney. Uh, as we discussed uh, in diabetes, there is a stage of hyperfiltration um, that's driven by hyperglycemia and this um, uh, autoregulatory defect of the artery uh, that's going in, which is mediated by the um, uh, angiotensin receptor. So now, if we, under these circumstances, inhibit the sodium glucose uh, reuptake by the SGLT2 inhibitor over here, 
we could actually normalize uh, this uh, tubular glomerular feedback again, because um, the distal sodium delivery is going to be higher. The glucose doesn't need to be taken up by sodium. So there is more sodium reaching the distal nephron. And therefore, um, due to the tubular glomerular feedback, this hyperfiltration is essentially normalized. Uh, and then this glomerular stretch and glomerular hydrophobic hypertrophy is not going to uh, cause a chronic damage on the kidney. Indeed, this is the reason why this is associated with a drop of EGFR acutely, similarly uh, when we start an ACE and an R. All right, so there are many, many studies now show the beneficial effect of the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, this was a very remarkable study because I was in Melbourne when this was actually presented, the Credence study. Uh, and uh, let's just uh, review this. So here, uh, there is the renal specific composite outcomes, which um, I would like to highlight to you. So those renal specific composite outcomes are the death dialysis doubling of serum creatinine. And I just want to highlight to you the hazard ratio here is 0.66, which is actually greater than we have seen in the previous studies, uh, very significant reduction over here. So as we discussed, uh, many studies have used you know, a variety of gliflozins. There is Kana, DAPA, EMPA, ertoglifosin, very large uh, sample sizes, uh, studies between five to 10,000 patients and showing a fairly similar effect size that in meta-analysis comes out to be a 40% reduction uh, for renal outcomes. Important to mention, uh, that our, um, the cardiovascular death, which is very important in patients with diabetes, uh, also showed a reduction. Uh, again, here are the different glifosins. Uh, you see the hazard ratio of uh, 0.85, indicating a fairly consistent 15% reduction in cardiovascular death. Also, heart failure and hospitalization is reduced by the SGLT2 inhibitors. You see, again, the different drugs have a similar effect size with roughly about 30% uh, reduction in hospitalization as well. And here is my slide comparing the SGLT2 inhibitors versus the ARBs. Uh, the drugs that was positive 20 years ago. And here is a side-by-side -side comparisons. Obviously, this is meta-analysis. There are population differences. There are patients differences. But at face value, if you look at the effect sizes of the uh, ARB, um, the angiotensin receptor blockers, their composite reduction is about 20%, um, uh, maybe 25%. But if you look at the effect of the SGLT2 inhibitors on renal outcomes, their effect size is roughly about 40%. So this, I mean, there is many caveats to this particular um, data set. But what you see is that you have much greater effect sizes here using the SGLT2 inhibitors compared to the ARBs. All right. So I guess this is something that um, I hope you are using this in your practice. Right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, something even newer came into the light of nephrologist uh, the summer of, well, this was actually a year ago by now. Uh, this is something called uh, firenanone. Uh, I think it's kind of impossible to pronounce. Uh, this is a non-steroidal mineral corticoid receptor antagonist um, uh, run by Bayer. Uh, two studies, um, I'm going to show you here. One of them where um, roughly 6,000 patients uh, with type 2 diabetes and SACD were randomized. Here is the usual renal outcomes, renal failure, 40% decreased GFR, death, and other causes. And what you see here is that uh, there was a 21% event rate in the placebo versus a 17% event rate in the fidelinone group. Uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.8, roughly about 20% reduction in uh, renal outcomes. 
Secondary outcomes in this study was heart, um, cardiovascular cause of hospitalization and death, also shown a, a significant uh, reduction by roughly about 16%, indicating that now we also have this mineral corticoid receptor antagonist um, to treat patients with uh, type 2 diabetes and kidney disease. Um, so how does this work? Um, I guess you have to go back to uh, renal physiology again, uh, which I am very happy to do. So aldosterone is our main mineral corticoid, which works via binding to the mineral corticoid receptor, which travels to the nucleus and binds to the mineral corticoid responsive element. Um, so interestingly enough that the mineral corticoid and the corticoid receptors, they uh, were uh, made uh, in evolution during gene duplications. So in many cells, there is mineral corticoid receptor, uh, but there are aldosterone sensitive cells. And those are the principal cells uh, in the kidney tubules that are responsible for sodium reabsorption, therefore volume regulation and potassium secretion. So in the kidney principal cells, we have an enzyme, the 11-beta-HSD2, which actually inactivates cortisol. So therefore, the mineral corticoid receptor is purely regulated by aldosterone. And then uh, they regulate uh, the sodium proton um, ATPase and the sodium channels, uh, and then regulate essentially sodium um, uptake. Uh, I just want to highlight there are several other cells and cell types where there is mineral corticoid receptor. So really uh, these uh, drugs could have a wide ranging effect of uh, regulating inflammation, glomerulosclerosis, vascular remodeling, podocyte injury, fibrosis, and oxidative stress. What? And I think... Um, uh, we will um, we will see uh, you know the exact mechanism of action on the molecular level, uh, but overall uh, you know they seem to have shown in two separate studies um, that they reduce uh, renal endpoints and cardiovascular disease. All right, so that leads us to the 2020 KDGO guidelines, uh, where finally there was a change about. Uh, how we approach patients with kidney disease and diabetes. Uh, the first line is always lifestyle therapy, which is um, exercise, nutrition, and weight loss, um, especially the patient that I presented to you. Obviously, his BMI is high. So uh, these, um, these interventions uh, over and over again uh, seem to show benefit for patients with diabetes and kidney disease. Um, unfortunately, it's somewhat difficult for patients to maintain this. Right now, the first line therapy is usually, uh, could be a combination of both metformin uh, and an SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, so there are different recommendations based on the GFR. So metformin, uh, there is a dose reduction uh, in under the 45, uh, and then we don't use it on patients with dialysis. SGLT2 inhibitors usually not uh, recommended to initiate under GFR less than 30. However, uh, all clinical trials actually kept patients on SGLT2 inhibitors, even those with relatively advanced renal failure. And it has shown to be safe, but it's not recommended by the FDA right now. And obviously um, we discontinue on dialysis. So when this is um, now considered, we consider this as a first line, additional drug therapies um, might be needed for glycemic control. And then now you have uh, a, a multiple agents that you could potentially uh, use uh, from. Uh, and this is your insulin, the sulfonylureas, the TZDs, the alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, the DPP-4 inhibitors, et cetera. From those, uh, the guideline puts preference on the GLP-1 receptor agonist. Uh, so I want to spend a few minutes on the GLP-1 receptor agonist as well. So the GLP-1 is, uh, uh, is a gut hormone. Uh, it comes from the GI tract. 
It acts on the brain, uh, reducing appetite. Indeed, there is a very impressive paper published in the New England Journal uh, that GLP-1 agonists were associated with up to 30% um, weight loss. Uh, it may have a, a cardioprotective effect. Um, it reduces glucose production by the liver and it reduces stomach emptying, which I think is probably the main effect of these two um, because it's a gut hormone essentially. So we don't have, you remember I have mentioned that there are hard outcome studies, which is the death dialysis and 40% of change in GFR. Um, which the FDA needs to approve a drug. Here, the GLP-1 agonist, um, the hard outcome renal studies are still pending, but uh, there are a couple of studies published which use kind of intermediate outcomes, which is the albuminuria, which is an important feature of uh, uh, diabetic kidney disease. And here you see new onset albuminuria showed a pretty significant um, reduction. Uh, in this, so these drugs are called the glutide. So, so this is liraglutide. Uh, this was the leader study. In this study, there was um, not a significant change in uh, ESRD, and then the doubling of serum creatinine was not significant. But I would like to mention that this was um, not meant to have to reach hard outcomes. The hard outcome studies are yet to come, uh, but based on the you know, significance in renal outcome, which was driven by the albuminuria, I think many uh, uh, kidney specialists put emphasis of using the GLP-1 agonist as a potentially um, uh, preferred second line uh, treatment for patients with diabetic kidney disease. In addition, uh, one more drug I think uh, needs to be uh, specifically highlighted. This is a very interesting um, uh, uh, kind of clinical trial. Um, so this is a, a endothelin A receptor antagonist, uh, which is called antracertan. Uh, uh, and the drug uh, was tried, um, but interestingly enough, uh, while the study was ongoing, the, the company essentially abandoned this particular study. Uh, so this was an interesting study. These drugs are associated with fluid overload. So uh, why 5,000 patients uh, were um, given antracertan, they excluded so-called non-responders uh, where they had a fluid overload or a 30% change in um, uh, albuminuria. And the study kept the responders, uh, that was 2,600 of them, they were randomized for the endothelin uh, or the placebo. And interestingly enough, um, the endothelin um, antagonist was associated with reduction in ESRD, also um, stroke, um, not with heart failure hospitalization with a median follow-up of 2.2 years. So overall, um, I think this is a, a kind of an interesting design, how they included patients, but I think we need to keep in mind that overall the patients who responded to that showed a significant benefit in terms of uh, kidney function decline uh, and also CV death and stroke. So this is the clinical landscape now in diabetic kidney disease in 2021. I think we need to emphasize the multidisciplinary collaboration that we need for patients with diabetes. And that includes the primary care, cardiology, nephrology, and endocrinology working side by side. Lifestyle management, exercise, diet, um, loss of smoke, no smoking, and so on is still very critical. Um, it is not easy to implement, uh, but I think studies over and over show their benefit. Uh, our primary goal is cardiovascular disease prevention. You remember, uh, we want to make sure people actually um, do not die of MI or heart failure. Uh, you remember the blood pressure goal of 130 over 80. Kidney protection is critical. Kidney disease is associated with all um, cause mortality. Uh, ACE and ARM are traditional um, drugs. 
SGLT2 and MRAs show significant um, uh, benefit of reducing, and they seem to be more uh, targeted therapy for this particular disease. And please um, stay alert uh, in this area because there are trials with the GLP1 and the tilin, and also a specific antifibrotic studies. And glucose management, while this is very, very important, we discussed that now we use permissive guidelines in terms of um, A1C. Uh, A1C of seven is a great goal for everybody, but you can personalize this to be higher based on patient's preference um, and age and other comorbidities. All right, so on the last uh, 10 minutes, I want to tell you a little bit about my work uh, and the questions that we are interested in. So, you know, one third of patients with diabetes develop kidney disease, so why is that so? Um, so studies over and over show that roughly 50% of this is somehow determined by your genes, roughly 50% of it by the environment leading to diabetic kidney disease development. So we have been interested, while the environment is, is important, it's kind of difficult to uh, you know, evaluate. So our group has been interested of figuring out the genetics of this particular disease. Uh, and then you know, kidney function, blood pressure, heritability is somewhere around 30 to 50%. Uh, so the studies that we have been in collaboration performing is something called genome-wide association studies, where right now we have data for 1.4 million people, where we look at the genetic polymorphisms, whether you have an A, G, or a T, or specific areas, and that association with kidney function. And these are shown here in something called Miami plots, where you have the chromosomal location and the strengths of an association with EGFR over here. Um, these studies showed 300 loci, but in the newest iterations, we had 800 loci showing association with kidney function. Uh, but if you look at an individual locus, you have many, many SNPs over here, over many, many genes, so the variant and the gene is not, uh, you know, is not immediately obvious from these genome-wide association studies. So our group uh, is basically interested in connecting these genetic variants to kidney disease development using a so-called multi-omic approaches. So we do um, want to figure out the cell type, which is playing an important role. Uh, the control regions, how this variant regulates gene expression, the target genes, and obviously the phenotype. And then uh, our work has been essentially connecting the dots, the proximal tubules, the genes, and the EGFR. So one of these important data set that we needed to generate is gene expression data for kidney samples, because if a variant is associated with the disease and the variant modulates the expression of specific genes, we could, using this something called EQTL studies, we could highlight the genes that are causally related to disease development. And we just had two publications on this. And I hope you appreciate this, but we call this translating these Manhattan plots, something which we call, actually the field calls this Miami plots. So, uh, where you have the same loci, but instead of just having the association of the SNP with the disease, you actually have a gene that's likely playing role, a specific loci. And since it's a highly polygenic traits, we have you know, 180 genes over here that likely plays a role in determining uh, your kidney function. So we took this to one step further. Uh, we generated uh, an expression data set using something called single cell transcriptomic uh, by digesting the kidney to single cell type and sequencing hundreds of thousands of cells. Each dot here is the gene expression data for one single cell type. And you see that, you know, of the different kidney cell types. So basically, you imagine that as the data matrix here, there are the cell types and all your 20,000 genes, we have a specific gene expression level. So this data set is very important because now we cannot just make Miami plots, we can make uh, additional plots where we could implicate the cell types, which is uh, mediating the effect or responsible to the certain 
phenotype development. So this is a uh, such plot, I didn't give a name yet, uh, where the x-axis shows the genes uh, that likely responsible for the trait development, and the y-axis implicates the cell type, and the bubble indicates um, statistical significance here. So what you see here is if you look at kidney function, EGFR, most of the bubbles are in the proximal tubules. They are light blue, indicating that the genes are playing a role in the proximal tubules. Therefore, the proximal tubules responsible for EGFR. Uh, if you look at systolic blood pressure, you see purple dots here. And the purple dots is endothelial cells or glomerular endothelial cells, indicating that if you want to know, uh, find the genes or the cells regulating systolic blood pressure, you want to work on endothelial cells. Uh, and then finally, I just show you some uh, specific examples, uh, which was very gratifying using this high throughput studies. Um, you know, the first drug that we had for really for diabetic kidney disease and, and hypertension was this any angiotensin converting enzymes inhibitors. And what we find is if we look at the systolic blood pressure GWAS, there was this Manhattan plot here showing a, a y-axis, this association between SNPs um, over here, but not very significant. But if you look at what genes these SNPs regulate is done here is the ACE gene, the angiotensin converting enzyme. And this uh, single cell um, data shows that these SNPs actually are in open chromatin region uh, in the proximal tubules and these dots here showing that this gene actually regulates the expression of ACE. So essentially, we have now a genetic proof um, that indicating why these drugs are so effective for patients with diabetes. Um, there was a similar um, finding for the angiotensinogen. Again, um, there is a genetic hit at this region and which regulates the expression of angiotensinogen. So, um, this is what we are playing right now in Philadelphia right now. So it's a dot to dot from genetic variants to disease development. Uh, we have many of these, uh, many of them look like this, the proximal tubules, the regulatory region, the target genes, and an intermediate phenotype. Um, so what did we find? And this is uh, kind of my final message over here. So what we found is that there are many of these genes that essentially likely causing um, or explaining the heritability of kidney function are localized to the kidney proximal tubules. Uh, and just highlighted the kidney proximal tubules for you here. Uh, it has a tremendous surface having this brush border. So it absorbs everything. It has the second highest mitochondrial content after the heart. Um, because it needs all the energy to reabsorb the salt and the glucose and the amino acids from the tubules. So the genes that we found is, uh, in addition to the proximal tubules actually have an important endocytic function because the glomerulus is a 60 kD size selective filter and everything on the 60 kD is endocytosed by the proximal tubules. So the genes that we found are this guy, DAP2, which is an adaptive protein in the endocytic pathway here. Uh, this gene called beta manosidase, which is in the lysosomes. Uh, we found a gene called um, DPEP1, which is also in the early endosome, CHMP1 in the recycling endosome, uh, a gene called DATCH1, which is in the nucleus, another one called caspase 9. And uh, overall, um, they seem to be regulating the endocytosis uh, and also the metabolism and the cell death. Uh, I think future studies will you know, help us to understand how these are connected and whether, whether we can actually highlight a specific mechanism also what's mediate the, the kidney function heritability. All right, so this is the summary kidney function including diabetic kidney disease is heritable. Uh, we run something called genome-wide association studies, which identify the large number of loci for kidney function and embrace for the next wave, because now we have 800 of such loci. 
Uh, and we using gene expression studies, we could actually uh, highlight genes uh, that likely explain this kidney function heritability. They are enriched in proximal tubular expression, um, blood pressure genes for, for endothelial cells. And functionally, they seem to be playing a role in metabolism and endolibosomal function of the proximal tubules. Where are we going from here? I just want to highlight our collaborative studies with the University of Miami renal team, which we call transformative research in diabetic nephropathy, uh, where we have 22 medical centers, including UM, patients with diabetes who are getting kidney biopsy and blood samples. Uh, and we're running a variety of omics analysis uh, with the goal uh, using, uh, using AI and ML to predict the pathways that um, essentially determine progression of kidney disease, not just kidney function, but why people uh, with a particular uh, kidney disease will progress uh, to end-stage kidney disease in the context of diabetes. And I'm really grateful for all the help uh, with the colleagues over at Miami. So I would like to close in here. As you could imagine, I haven't done any of this work. Um, I have uh, many people in the lab who are responsible. If you have questions, this is my email. Please send an email. And if you are interested in data sets that we have generated along the way, um, you know, in, in mice and humans, um, uh, I pay for this, lab, for this domain and you can try to look it up. So thanks so much for the invitation and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Shustak. That was a be beautiful grand rounds, very clear. I like the basic physiology and the combination with genetics. It was, it was very, very nice. So thank you. And we thank the Lipson family as well for sponsoring today's Grand Rounds. We have time for a few questions. Maybe I'll begin by asking, I see the, uh, the importance of the GWAS studies and, GWAS studies and identifying candidate genes. I'm concerned as we all are when we look at these types of studies as to how social determinants of disease are interacting with the genetic determinants. And so how do you account for that? You know, in the old days, we used to have, um, unfortunately, I think, uh, standard GFRs for African Americans, which was different from whites. And I think that that really was a um, in a way, racism at the level of, uh, of nephrology, um, if, if you can excuse me. Um, I, I think though that uh, it behooves us at this point, and I'm, at, I'm interested how you might deal with those factors as it affects your GWAS analyses. Ah, thank you so much for the question. I think there are multiple questions here. I think one very important factor to highlight for the, you know, for the students and the interns and, you know, all the colleagues out here, that indeed uh, the GFR equation used uh, race as a, as a factor, how it was calculated. And I think uh, an effort to multiple people, including my very own colleague, Amaka, at UPenn, where uh, I think these race equations and this uh, race-based GFR calculations are essentially for most electronic medical records. Uh, so now we are in the era where we are looking for new uh, the race equations. There was a major breakthrough a couple of weeks ago where two papers published um, where the Crick study, um, which is also from Penn, um, uh, used uh, and suggested a new GFR uh, equation and um, which, which does not use race as a coefficient. So I think that will be very, very important for future studies and implementing that. Thank you. So, Dr. Oh, I would like to add that many of them is actually cystatin blazed, and I would like to su support the fact that in your practice, you may want to measure cystatin and not, not estimate EGFR based on creatinine. Sorry. Yeah. Great point. Dr. Fornoni first, and then Dr. Hare. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, I know very little about GWAS study, but uh, I, and I may have missed it. But uh, were you able to also <clears throat> identify the collagen for alpha-3 that uh, Dr. Flores has seen as a predictor of outcome? And what do you think about that? I'm always puzzled by the fact 
the patients that have mutation in collagen 4 that present with thickening of the GBM are actually uh, a predictor of uh, it's actually a predictor of outcome. I have difficulties to reconcile this. Can you and me? Yeah, really, really good point. So yes, yeah, so um, indeed we run these studies together, um, which we call Genie. It's a collaborative study for finding genes for diabetic kidney disease. That genetic study is slightly different. Um, and the trait we are mapping is different. So the traits we mapped in Gini was mostly albuminuria-based definition of diabetic kidney disease. So uh, we used multiple definitions, macroalbuminuria, microalbuminuria, albuminuria progression. And as you uh, pointed out, uh, the top signal was in collagen um, a variant in collagen for a basement membrane protein. Interestingly enough, it was a protective uh, variant. Uh, so I think we can go on for a quite for a long time. So I think we're collaborating with multiple people right now to knock in that variant into mice and into organoids and see how that essentially um, alters the collagen composition. This is not something that I do, but I think it would indicate that indeed that particular variant is responsible for the basement membrane defect in early diabetes. Uh, that is different, right? So the albuminuria and the GFR phenotype in diabetes is mostly linked, but not completely. So this would be an albuminuria type of a phenotype. But again, because these variants are linked, I think we have to be very careful to make a judgment a priori whether this is really the causal pathway. So we have to do, like with these other studies, we have to do the experiments in, in model systems and I think in mice to show that these um, variants are you know, responsible for the albuminuria or for the basement membrane defect in the context of diabetic kidney disease. Thank you. Hi, Catalin. Thank you for a really uh, wonderful lecture. Um, uh, my question pertains back to the clinical part of your talk. Um, uh, I was, yeah, I'm, I, I specialize in, in heart failure therapeutics and it's, it's fascinating to see and really not surprising in retrospect, but it's all the same classes of drugs that you referred to as we, as our standard of care for congestive heart failure. The question relates to um, using the drugs in, in combination. In, in heart failure, the progression has always been one class gets developed and then the next trial always has to be done on the background of best conventional care. But the way you, you contrasted the effect sizes uh, between uh, so, uh, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers and the SGLT2 inhibitors, what, what's known about the combination? Is there an additive or synergistic effect in slowing, in slowing the progression of disease if patients are on both classes of drugs? And now you're also getting into the same thing with heart failure, multiple classes of drugs. So what is the clinical approach in terms of starting one class, adding the next, the next, the next, the next? So that's the million dollar question. I would say a billion dollar question where I don't have a response. And I, so I have an opinion, which I am happy to share, but I think I would say this is an opinion and you know this is not standard of care. So if you see your patients, uh, that I can only offer my opinion. <clears throat> so that I think, SGLT2 inhibitors seem to work um, you know, at all stages, and I think it's very reasonable, and I have seen presentations in the latest AHA as well for heart failure, that instead of doing sequentially, maybe we should just do this in combination and start together. But, you know, um, to be fair, uh, I would like to disclose the fact that indeed we are running uh, something called Trident 2.0 study, where we are looking at the molecular effect of the SGLT2 inhibitor in the kidney and the ACE inhibitors in the kidney to see whether there are subclasses of patients that would respond better or everybody responds to a certain degree and then we should just start them together you know, in a small dose. Um, I think these are competing um, uh, views. I, uh, I, am on the, I am on the combination view uh, to start all together uh, as fast as possible. Thank you very much for an outstanding Grand Rounds and our invitation stands for you to come and visit us in Miami when you have the opportunity. So thank you everyone for attending today's Grand Rounds.
And I believe next week is the Thanksgiving holiday and we won't be having uh, Grand Rounds that Wednesday. Um, look, look on your uh, emails for uh, further details.